Hi, my name is Andy Kirk, and this is a 2022 data visualization health check. How's it going? In the next 20 minutes or so, I want to provide a helicopter view of the data viz world. From my perspective, being in the field for the last 10, 12 years, what's happening? How's it all going? What's new? What's changing? What's happened? What's happening? What's not happening? The key issues, the key developments, the key patterns. And this will hopefully supplement the analysis and the reflections from the main survey. The way that I want to tackle this is to dissect the field across 15 different perspectives. Recently, I completed my very first Lego set in about 30 odd years. Uh, it's the Seinfeld set. And when I was finishing this, it felt to me like I was taking this helicopter view of that scene, of that situation. And I felt there were different motifs and objects in this scene that I could use to stand for and represent the different issues I want to share with you today. So there are 15 different elements covering three main areas, the creation, the creating, the creators, issues around the capability, the development of our knowledge, dissemination and growth, and then the people, the community, the members, and how we have an impact in the field at large. So beginning with data, the, the ingredients in the, in the food cupboard is the uh, metaphor here. Maybe 10 years ago, I think we were focused and dominated in our attention on data with respect to new data sets and the access that we were now finding through different marketplaces, different APIs, different ways of accessing social media. And it all felt very new, very exciting. I think what's happened in the last 10 years and certainly in the last two or three years, especially, there is now greater discourse about the responsibilities that come with data, the trust, the ownership, the, the responsibilities of being custodians and responsible custodians of data. On the right hand side, three books that particularly for me kind of encapsulate this new thinking, this fresh thinking, Living in Data by Jay Thorpe, Data Feminism by Catherine Dinazio and Lauren Klein, and Whole Numbers and Half-Truths by Rukmini. These are all books that make us think about the kind of human side of data, the ethics, the responsibilities, who's missing, who's been disenfranchised by data. And it's not just through books, projects, research papers. The Living With Data website is a research project over a number of years, researchers in the UK. The book and the paper by John, do no harm, applying equity, awareness in data visualization. These are all brilliant resources that ask us to think about our role and our involvement with and in data. Technology. It feels to me that the most important developments in tech in recent years have actually been the growth of existing applications and libraries and tools, perhaps more so than brand new tools emerging. And this is very broad brush summary of, in my experience working with training delegates and clients, the most common tools that most people are using most often. And this will be supported or argued against in the results of the survey. I mean, Excel still stands out as the desktop tool of choice. We are still limited by the capabilities of this dominant tool. And I think it's still a case that there isn't a tool that does everything and nor will there or should there ever be a tool that does everything. I think for me, what's exciting really is the development of new tools like perhaps Flourish and Raw Graphs and Data Wrapper over the last five, eight years that took away the burden of people like me who cannot code to an advanced level. We don't need to do that. We can use these very powerful graphical user interfaces to create very rich, very kind of creative visualizations. In terms of creations, I think we've definitely been through a golden period. The last 10 years, perhaps peaking around 2018, 19, we've seen some wonderful new novel techniques, chart types, approaches. Now, every year, there's always collections of lists. Um, Martin Lambrecht does a wonderful job of collating all the best of lists. So if you want to just access inspirational content, visit Martin's website, 
you see he's been making these collations for the last six, seven years, just to sort of nourish your creativity. I try and do that on a monthly basis to get a sense of the most important, impressive visualizations and projects I've encountered every month. But we're still growing. We're still seeing wonderful new work all the time. I think what's interesting, though, if we look at the creators, I still feel there's something missing here. We've got brilliant, talented freelancers, like, for example, Gabriel Marit. We've got the dominance still of the data journalism and the newsrooms. We've got the studios, like Clever Franca, Graphicacy, and Moritz Stefan are working with collaborators in Germany. And the great thing about those bottom three is that they've all been very much part and parcel of the development of important dashboards and analysis for coronavirus. But I think what's missing for me and why I chose the motif, Vandalay Industries, we still don't see or access a lot of the wonderful stuff that must be being created in organisations, in corporations that doesn't get that public visibility that a lot of, of this other work does. So how do we access this? How do we learn and discover more about what is taking place behind the four walls of organisations out there? Consuming. Now, this is beyond just consume in terms of are we seeing dominance in print or digital, in mobile or laptop? I mean, it, I think it's fair to say that we all recognise the vast dominance and growth of mobile as being the, the primary platform. But this is more of a, a point of view of the capability of viewers, of readers to consume work. And I think it's been really encouraging to see far more emphasis on visualization literacy, data literacy amongst different practitioners and different authors over the last few years. Ben Jones, for example, CEO now of Data Literacy, and he's done two books, Data Literacy Fundamentals, Learning to See Data. And this is all about equipping audiences that we are trying to reach with the ability to make sense of, to read and to draw insights from our work. Because it's a two-sided thing. We can make all these wonderful creations, but is the audience, is society ready for those things? John Schwabish, in his series, One Chart at a Time, educating people how to make sense of individual chart types to broaden their repertoire of understanding. And then in terms of accessibility, the wonderful resource and the, the pioneering thoughts from Frank Alasky, who was really provoked and challenged people like myself to think more empathetically about visual impairments, about disabilities, about different barriers that people have and experience in reaching, accessing and understanding visualizations. So the, the resource that Frank has been working on, Chartability, is a vital new development in the field. In terms of discourse in the field, I was a little bit dismayed by the, the response to the very <laughs> hotly discussed spiral chart. And the reason why I was dismayed is that I felt there were too many people taking this as a very literal chart reading device. In my view, it was about getting a feel for data, about getting a feel for this continuous spiral of the coronavirus pandemic that we've experienced, more so than just reading off numbers, it was about feeling that repetition and when will it all end? But perhaps that was a bit unfair of me to be dismayed. When I was recently reflecting on the last 10 years in the field, it felt like some of the discussions that emerged from this new chart had already taken place 10 years, 12 years ago. I always recall the Information Visualization Manifesto published by Manuel Lima in 2009. But the reason why it's harsh for me to be dismayed is that people weren't around then. I was, some of us were, but many of us were not. And so it's very easy for me to get bored and tired by repeated arguments. For many people, these are the first times that they have had that discussion and enlightenment about new methods and new approaches. And I always reflect back on a really important article by Fernando Viegas and Martin Wattenberg, 2015. And what I feel is still a, a key touch point or a key 
finish line for us in many respects is we will know that visualization has matured as a medium when we see as much criticism about content as we do about technique. And perhaps we are still caught up in technique because there are many new people learning about technique. At some point, we will look beyond that and challenge and look at just the content. On the theme of writing, what outputs exist? Well, we still have blogs and thanks to people like Nathan Yao, Flowing Data, we still have those wonderful resources keeping us in touch with the latest developments and thoughts. Nightingale has been a wonderful development over the last two or three years. The articles, the quality of the articles, the variety of articles is absolutely exceptional. Newsletters have become a very important channel for The Economist and many others. The Economist published this off the charts, the best of data journalism. They also do um, between the lines, this kind of reflective analysis of their own graphical output. Brilliant, brilliant products. New books. I'm so excited to look, at, look forward to three new books. Neil Richards, Questioned in Data Viz. Lisa Moot, who will be developing work in progress for now, a book about colour and how much is that needed. And also Jen Christensen from Scientific American. These are three people who have got really important things to share, things to educate us about through books, and I can't wait for to, to see those emerging. The channels that we publish and experience work. We have changed a lot. You know, 10 years ago, it was very much about blogs, RSS feeds, and then social media erupted. Twitter still dominates in many respects. But of course, we've got Instagram, people like Mona Chalabi. We've got YouTube, um, Robert Kazara, publishing these excellent, really kind of well-produced and viable uh, discussions, especially about science in data viz. For want of uh, my own uh, blowing my, my own trumpet, the Explore Explain series, where I do video interviews with data viz practitioners, it's also a podcast output. And there are brilliant podcasts, data stories, storytelling with data, Ali Torban, with there's so many, so many different outputs there that are wonderful to listen to, to watch, and also to read. And how great it is to see the Nightingale print magazine launching soon. So where next? Where will we see new platforms emerging? LinkedIn is, in my view, very much a kind of a new place to share things. Facebook, is that still important? Is that declining? Who knows? In terms of learning, there's nothing visual to share on this forum, but I do believe over the last decade, we've seen lots of growth in commercial training opportunities, video, virtual, of course, over the last two years, the pandemic, apart from all the horrible things that have emerged from it, some good. It's forced us to find new remote ways to, to learn, to engage, to develop and to teach. There are many more qualifications that exist graduate opportunities, postgraduate opportunities. Perhaps the missing link in all this is schools, under 18s. How do we teach kids and build up their visual literacy at a young age? Moving on to academia. And so we've got two kind of gentlemen arguing in this case, because it is very much about developing new ideas, challenging conventions, disrupting existing approaches. And I think one of the most important outputs from all this emerged in December of last year, work by Steve Franconeri and others. This, um, the science of visual data communication, what works, this summary of many different research studies to give a single at a glance view of all the things that have rights and wrongs and the things that we know and things that we don't yet know. Again, people like Robert, are doing sterling work to try and find a way to communicate discoveries, research, developments on that academic side and make it accessible to everyday practitioners. And I do feel the, the main flagship academic conference, Viz, is doing better and better at making that academic forum accessible to everybody. It needs to be the centerpiece academic institute, of course it does. But for people like myself, looking to learn and to apply that to everyday projects, teaching, writing, 
this is a really important development over the last two or three years to make the findings more accessible. Finally, moving on to membership and the community and the people involved in this world. Now, again, Jill will have covered off who is in the field, the demographics. It feels, again, from my perspective, just from the kind of exposure I have to different delegates who come to training courses, clients, that it is finally, thankfully, a much more diverse world across all different spectrums. Maybe that was not the case 10 years ago, but it feels from my perspective, as a white male, of course, that we've got so many more different talents, young and old, diverse backgrounds, di diverse skill sets, and that is enriching the field. And it feels to me that's been very much the case over the last five or six years, especially. But with regards to membership, and thinking about the obstacles that exist that, again, Jill will have summarised around language barriers, around time, around finance, around the kind of viability of careers. We need to think about who is not in the field and what are the reasons why somebody may be stopped, prevented from entering the field or even just put off. Can we maintain what I feel seems to be a very healthy, very welcoming field? Is that the case? It's very easy for us to say that internally, but is that the case for those externally? Moving on to community in a very literal sense, coming together. Obviously, over the last two years, that's been largely prevented. And thankfully, events like Outlier, events like the Show Conference, um, the most recent event, which was called Encore, there's been some brilliant virtual events that hopefully will continue to exist as, if not purely virtual, then at least hybrid going forward. It's wonderful to see the resumption of IO conference in 2022. There are some community events that have disappeared. Malofiesh, sadly, sounds like it will not continue. One of the most important, um, again, centerpiece events of the year. The Information is Beautiful Awards. There are Lots of debates about the merits of contests and awards, but there surely has and exists a need for a place to celebrate and to kind of come together to, to celebrate the, the best of the field, the best people in the field. The Data Viz Society, though, has been a wonderful development over the last two or three years. And I think, again, think about membership and access. It really has given a new voice to lots of people, perhaps who were otherwise, if not disenfranchised, then trying to shout in amongst a lot of noise. And I think the, the discussions and the, the tone of discussions that take place, especially on the Slack channels, is really, really healthy. And then again, back to Twitter, uh, the 30 day map challenge is one of the best community events that takes place every year. This is the uh, month of November, 30 different map styles or topics. And then you see the the repertoire of work that emerges from these wonderfully talented cartographers. So again, I feel that the community is healthy and in a post pandemic space, it'll be fascinating to see how we resume in person events and meetups. The matter of mobility is one of career progression. And again, there's nothing to show here, it's more a thought. And think about the roles that people have, the diversity of roles that people have. Are these data viz roles or are these roles that have data viz elements? And what career pathways exist, both vertically and horizontally? You don't have to just go up to have a progressive career. Is industry recognizing data viz as a profession, as a role? Do we have departments? Do we have senior positions in organizations? One would hope that the significant data event that has been the pandemic will shine a light on this subject and maybe encourage more and more organizations to take up the opportunity to start to not just bring in roles, but full on careers and pathways. And then lastly, in closing, reach. And there's two perspectives to this. What impact are we having? Now, of course, again, on the note of the pandemic, it's been both 
a health event, a medical event, but also a data event. And so people like John Byrne Murdoch, for example, they've reached a whole new audience, a non-data audience historically. People have been glued to these new developments, new analysis that John produces. Even just things like the lateral flow test, these rapid tests that we now are using, they are visualizations of data, data that's uncertain, that's imperfect, but lets us get through life, hopefully. The reach of COP26, the visuals, the Ed Hawking stripe maps, climate stripes, the fact that these stripes are now everywhere in The Economist, in music events, in concerts. The IPCC report had some brilliant visualizations that really helped to make more people aware of the key issues. So the reach of the field has perhaps never had more impact, but the reason why I've picked the goldfish bowl is it can be very easy for us to look inside our own bowl and think that everything is rosy, that we're having great impacts, that we are very, very important. But we need to keep looking outside. We need to keep be open to new ideas, new creative fields, new creative techniques from non-traditional data worlds. So this is just a reminder for us to not be complacent and to keep pushing and progressing this field forward. Thank you very much for listening.